In this video, I introduce the concept of an extensive forum game, and then I demonstrate a method of how to solve extensive forum games called backward induction. An extensive forum game is a structured way to analyze how two or more individuals interact strategically with one another. Suppose that we have two players in this game. One's name is Draco, the other one's name is Harry. And these players can take actions, such as casting spells. Uh, for example, Draco can cast a spell named A, or a spell named C. And Harry can cast a spell named X, or a spell named S. Harry's spell, X after A, may have a different effect than X prime after A, which may be the exact same spell, but it's a different effect and it shows that the timing of this um, of the actions actually has uh, an important consequence here. When a game is in equilibrium, none of the players have an incentive to unilaterally deviate from that equilibrium play. In a two-player game, an equilibrium means that each player's strategy is a best response to the other's strategy. Now, what do I mean by a strategy? Well, a strategy is a contingent plan what the agent wants to do given the actions of the other player. And we'll be looking for pairs of strategies, Harry and Draco, which are a best response to the other strategy. To take a concrete example within this game, Draco, if Draco casts spell A and then subsequently Harry casts spell X, both, uh, both players would receive a payoff of 5. The way I've written this, Draco receives the first five, and Harry receives the second five. Now, if it was C and then X prime, Draco would receive four, and Harry would receive five. This is what's going to motivate our solution to the extensive form game. Notice that if Draco started off right here, he has no idea what his payoffs will be later on down, down the tree, without reasoning through what Harry would do, and then what he would subsequently do. So a natural place to start is here at the bottom of the tree, because at the bottom of the tree, the individual knows exactly what the stakes are. Then, reasoning backwards, Harry can put himself in Draco's shoes, deduce what he would do, and deduce what his payoffs would be from that. So on and so forth, up to, the, up to Draco's first node, and what we would get is we would get a solution to this game. This process is known as backwards induction. And so let's go ahead and apply a backwards induction solution to this game and see how all this works. So let's start at the lower level of this tree where Draco is faced with two distinct choices. On the left branch of the tree, we see that Draco has a choice between A and C. Now, Draco could choose C and get three or he could choose A and get 2. So he's going to choose C and get 3. If we go over to the right branch, Draco would choose A because 5 is better than 2. If we go up to the second level of this game, uh, what we'll see is that Draco's actions will just translate into these payoffs. And so what we can do is we can rewrite the tree to represent this fact. Okay, so what I did is I promoted the payoffs up to the next level, the payoffs of 3 and 4, given that Draco chose C, and the payoffs of 5 and 3, given that Draco chose A prime. But we can keep track of what precisely Draco's moves are throughout this game. So Harry gets to this node. He's going to be weighing whether he wants 5 or 4. So he prefers more or less, he's going to choose X. Over here, on this side, he's going to be choosing between 5 and 3. Those are Harry's choices, and we get to promote these payoffs. So now we get to the final step of the problem. We get to Draco's first node, and what we'll see is that now Draco is choosing between big A and big C. Um, Draco prefers 5 to 4, and so he'll choose A. Now rewriting the game tree back to its uh, original full form, we can see where the equilibrium lies and where these out of equilibrium strategies uh, fall as well. Uh, you can see this blue path denotes the equilibrium outcome. Um, this is the outcome that we actually get. We get A and X. So Draco plays spell A, Harry plays spell X, and they realize 
a payoffs of 5 and 5. Um, we could also see that if we actually got to this note, Draco would play a spell C. If we got to this note, Harry would play a spell X. If we got to this note, Draco would play a spell A prime. Now these are all specified in these strategies, which are the equilibrium strategies that are the best response to one another. We have the equilibrium strategies, we have the equilibrium outcome, and we have the equilibrium payoffs for each of the agents. And so this gives us a nice sense for how these two individuals interact strategically. Let's consider a slight tweak on this game and see that these games are not always as simple as this one to solve. Now this is an identical game to the one that we just solved, except for I changed this payoff, that's now 4, I changed it from 5. This will give us a real sense for why we have uh, established these concepts of strategy, payoff, and outcome as distinct objects in this extensive game theory. Hopefully, it will give you a sense for how important it is to have these concepts clear in your head. We're going to use backward induction, and Draco on the third stage is going to solve a back up. He's going to choose C on the left node. He's going to choose A prime on the right side, uh, because those were his optimal choices from before. Now again, just as before, we can look at this right node that Harry has. It looks just the same as before, and what we'll see is that Harry will choose X prime just as he did before. But here's where we run into trouble. At this node, Harry is indifferent between X and S. Note that he gets a payoff of 4 now, regardless of which option he picks. So he might as well pick X, or he might as well pick S. But it doesn't matter what he does. In fact, he could put a probability weight that he plays X, so he might actually act randomly. Uh, that's what's called a randomized strategy, or a mixed strategy. Let's denote the probability that he places on action X as P. What is the payoff for, uh, for Draco of choosing A? Well, we can go ahead and compute that just by computing the uh, probability weighted average of the payoffs. So Draco's expected payoffs would be 5 times P plus 3 times 1 minus P. When is it optimal for Draco to choose A? versus choosing C. It's going to be optimal to choose A when this payoff from going down the A branch is bigger than 4. It's optimal to choose C when it is the other way around. Where P is bigger than 1 half, Draco will find it optimal to choose A in his strategy. But if it is less than 1 half, then Draco will find it optimal to choose C. So let's consider the two cases. If P is bigger than one half, this strategy pair says that Draco's best response is to play A, little c and little a from before, which got us these payoffs in the first place. And Harry's best response to that, or one of Harry's best responses, because he's indifferent of the value of P, is to pick P bigger than one half and uh, pick X prime on the right hand side of the tree. So this will realize payoffs of 5p plus 3, 1 minus p for Draco, and 4 for Harry. Now let's consider case 2, where p is less than 1 half, and that implies that Draco's optimal choice is to choose c. When Draco chooses c, we get the payoff of 4 and 5. We have strategies of Draco choosing c, little c, and a prime, and Harry chooses p less than 1 half and x prime. And the payoff in equilibrium is just 4, 5. This game has an order of magnitude more complication than the previous game. And it goes to show how complicated game theory can actually become, just with one little tweak of a number. When we did that, the whole complexion of the game changed. We had to consider a whole variety of actions, and those actions could induce multiple equilibria to the game. But fortunately, our, our strategy of using backward induction didn't fail us. In fact, it allowed us to under, uncover some valuable insights into the strategic nature of these two players in this game.